All right, so, so far we've talked about heterogeneous and then uh, heterogeneous immunoassays, in particular, uh, both competitive and non-competitive. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to add to the prior discussion about competitive immunoassays real quick was when you would use a competitive assay as opposed to a non-competitive assay. Uh, and you can ask yourself, why would I want to do this type of assay where um, I'm, I'm having these two types of analyte and in fact, I need a whole other type of reagent. Um, well, the time that it's most commonly used is when there's only one antibody available for the antigen. Uh, instead of being able to make a sandwich, or when their antigens are so small that they couldn't even fit binding two antibodies in two different sites. So for example, many small molecule analytes are best targeted by a, a competitive immunoassay because it really only they can only bind to one antibody at a time. Things like glucose or many biomarkers, and that's why they're so commonly used uh, for drug development and biomarker detection. Okay, so now I would like to move on to the last type of immunoassay that we're going to cover, and that's homogeneous immunoassays. Um, and these are a, a little bit different in terms of how we think about them than the normal heterogeneous assays where we bind things to a plate, uh, because it really changes, the absence of a surface really changes how we can work with the bound materials um, and, and, and has both pros and cons. All right, so in our typical heterogeneous immunoassay where we're binding to a plate, um, we have a plate and then we might bind various things to it. Maybe we bind one antibody and then we do an antigen and then we do another antibody and then we do a label. So there's a lot of steps here and in between all the steps, we haven't emphasized it much, um, but there's washing. So you wash between every single step. Um, and this is in fact, um, a major part of learning to do these assays properly is how to properly wash in a way that is reproducible without introducing variability. So wash between um, every step. And washing can take time. Uh, if it's being automated by a robot, it might just take a few minutes. Um, but it, uh, if being done by hand, it can take um, even up to like five minutes per plate. Um, and so that can really add up, especially if say you're trying to run 10 plates at once by hand in the lab, or you know when people do this at, in high throughput in drug development, they might be running five or 5,000 plates at once. Um, and so you can really imagine how all this wash time can add up even when they have fast robotic washing that's down to a minute or so. Uh, and so this, this introduces not only a time delay, but also a lot of room for variability between running uh, because washing, meaning filling the plate with a buffer and then dumping it out, there's a lot of room in liquid handling for error. Um, and so it can increase uh, the variability and therefore decrease the precision of the assay. Okay, so um, these are some disadvantages of the heterogeneous assays, um, even though we know and love them very well. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, to, to that, a normal uh, plate bound or any surface bound assay, you can ask yourself, how do we get the reagents to the surface? So you pipette them on, but then you're waiting for molecules to do what to get to the surface? They have to diffuse. So each step um, is diffusion limited. And so we're really waiting on diffusion to go potentially um, hundreds of microns or millimeters even. And so that can really, oops, that can really add to the time that is needed for these assays to proceed. Um, and so we often incubate each single step um, for 30 minutes to two hours. Uh, and so that again adds up when you have three, four, five, six steps um, to do in these multi-step assays. So, um, these types of assays, though very useful and common, are slow and, and prone to variability. So this is where homogeneous assays come in and really shine, um, is that they can instead, uh, they just do everything in solution. So there is no surface, there's no plate, there's no bead. Um, and as a result, your antibody and your antigen is just binding in solution. Um, and so you're in free solution. 
And that speeds you up in multiple ways. So the first major one, as you can imagine, is what? Well, there's no washing. Um, and that means uh, the advantage of that is that, you know, you get faster assay times and less variability um, is a big one. So uh, this is a major advantage, less variability, higher precision, um, and less steps, okay? Less steps and therefore faster. Okay, and less to automate for those robotic liquid handlers when we're scaling this up. In addition, it's also faster for another reason, and that's because we don't have to wait for diffusion to take molecules through millimeters of solution down to a surface. Instead, they're just randomly diffusing until they meet each other and then we're done. Um, and so the diffusion distance that you have to go is much shorter. And so um, you don't have to wait as long, right? So, um, so shorter diffusion distances and um, therefore faster assays. Um, often these things are done in minutes um, instead of having to wait hours. So that's a real advantage. Okay. So it's fewer steps and done in minutes, all right? So big advantage. Now, can you see perhaps how this is hard? What, why don't we just do this all the time? Um, and so th that's because we really require some special reporters to be able to do this. Because what I drew, what you see there is an antigen bound to some labeled antibody, but of course that isn't really all that's happening. So when you set this up, you're gonna be adding, say a mixture of, you know, maybe here's your sample and then you have your, your labeled antibody, but it, you know, how do you tell the ones that are bound versus the ones that are free in solution? Um, that is not trivial to do, uh, especially let's say if you were just measuring fluorescence, you wouldn't be able to tell at all uh, that in this case, one of the molecules is bound and the other one is free. You would just see fluorescent intensity from two molecules regardless of bound or free, right? So um, this requires special probe design or special instrumentation in order to be able to distinguish bound probes from free probes, okay? Um, and so that's really the, the caveat with these homogeneous immunoassays um, is that you, really have to think carefully about the design of the assay um, in order to be able to detect binding without any washing of unbound reagents. Okay, so, all right. Um, and so we really have to think carefully. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about how it is possible to do that. Uh, the first way, um, is by designing a special reporter, okay? And so usually it, it, it may not, it's usually not as simple as just straight fluorescent intensity. Uh, and so we can do it in one way by taking advantage of uh, FRET, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, energy transfer. Sorry, I can't write and talk at the same time here. All right, so we've got our reporter design. Um, and so we might take advantage of a FRET pair. Um, and so here, instead of doing what I just drew up above where we have one uh, label on there, maybe you have a big analyte and then you take two antibodies and when they both, they bind to different places and when they both are bound, then we get a FRET transfer and we can see. So this would require then having two reagents that both bind to the same antigen, um, and then we got a FRET pairing. And so you would only see that positive FRET signal when those two antibodies are closest together, and that's statistically unlikely unless they're bound to the antigen. So that's one way. Um, another way would be to take advantage of FRET where um, perhaps there's already on the antigen somehow a fluorophore, and then your labeled uh, detection reagent has another fluorophore, and so now you get fret pairing. So there might be a way to take advantage of it like that. Um, or finally, there's another way um, where you might have uh, your antigen unlabeled, which is much more common than having a labeled antigen, and then you have some kind of uh, detection reagent that is in one conformation with no fret when it's unbound, but then once it binds, 
uh, it folds up or changes conformation and now you have fret pairing. And so that kind of conformational change reagent um, is, is, is a favorite one, um, but you can imagine how it would take a lot of special planning um, in order to design a reagent that does that, okay? Um, and, and there are indeed a lot of efforts that go into designing these. For example, um, DNA aptamers are, are often used for this uh, because they're flexible. Um, you can also do peptides that fold up uh, when bound uh, and other types of reagents that have flexibility to be able to do that conformational change format, okay? Um, so that's one way to get a homogeneous immunoassay, okay? Um, there are other ways, and uh, another one is by taking advantage of instrumentation that can distinguish the change in motion as a result of binding. So, for example, um, we could use uh, fluorescence polarization, where we look at the change in the rate, the rate of change of polarization of the light, and we see that um, light remains uh, more polarized when the molecules are moving more slowly. Um, and so um, that happens when they're bigger, which means it happens when they're bound. So what we can see is that, let's say your labeled antibody is rotating around in solution. Um, this is, I'm trying to draw here rotation. When it's unbound, so it's rotating relatively fast, but then it binds some big analyte. And so now it has like this big boulder attached to it. So its rotation is slower. Um, we see that when we measure the polarization of the fluorescence that's coming from it as a slower change in polarization or a slower loss in polarization. And so we would actually be able to tell that um, like what population of the antibody has bound the antigen versus being free. Okay, so that's one way. Um, there's many other types of uh, assays and instrumentation that take advantage of this change in motion, um, either rotation or translational diffusivity. Um, another one that is uh, popular in the COFISO lab is uh, EPR spectroscopy. Um, and that's really taking advantage too of changes uh, in tumbling rate. Okay, so um, that's one worth knowing for our department. Um, but there's others too. We can even sometimes use light scattering, which we talked about in one of the prior papers um, that, that we've read, one of our literature papers. Okay, so that one would take advantage of being able to tell changes in translational diffusion that the molecule slows down once it's bound to something big. Okay. Um, okay, so we can ask ourselves, why might we use an assay like this? Um, and as we said before, well, actually, I will let you answer that question. All right, so here is your concept check. Um, and uh, so which of the following are true when comparing a, heter a, a homogeneous assay to a heterogeneous assay? So are the homogeneous assays faster? Um, do they have fewer washing steps in art? Do they require simpler instruments? compared to heterogeneous assays. So pause and think about that. All right, and then here's the answer. So um, I think this is gonna come to you. Let's see, there we go. All right, so uh, here's the answer is that the first two are true, the homogeneous assays are faster, uh, both because they have fewer washing steps and because uh, you have less distance to diffuse before the molecules meet up with each other than compared to getting all the way to a plate. Um, however, they either require the same type of instrumentation or more, more complex instrumentation than you would have when you're able to wash away that excess analyte. Okay. Um, so they have real pluses and minuses. So that wraps up homogeneous immunoassays. Uh, and um, I hope that between these two videos, now you know about both heterogeneous, competitive, and non-competitive, and homogeneous immunoassays. So now you're uh, aware of all of the major classes of immunoassays that are used in bioanalytical chemistry.